Hello again, and welcome to the fourth session of the Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference, uh, Watershed Function in Forest Management, the Role of Forests in Hydrologic Resilience. My name is still Alec Brown. I apologize for disappearing on you on the last uh, panel or session. I My computer died on me, uh, as we all have probably experienced in Zoom over the last few years. So hopefully I make it through this one. Um, You've probably already heard all the, uh, this a few times today, but uh, if you run into any issues during the session or have any questions about the conference, please email the address ad at the address that's pinned in the chat box to the right. Uh, you can also use the chat uh, to send messages, but keep in mind that any messages will be visible to all attendees. If you would like to submit any questions to the speaker, please use the Q please use the Q and A feature. Uh, we will be sorting through the questions and presenting them to the speaker at the end of the presentation. Uh, and a reminder that once again, that the, the session will be recorded and available to all next week. Um, yeah, so let's get into it. So watersheds are holistic systems in which land management in the uplands can directly influence stream flow at lower elevations. Stream flow in the dry season limits the availability of water, both in stream uses, i.e. for fish health and out of stream uses in the summer months. Forests occupy an important role in the water balance of many watersheds and how they are managed can influence their impact on water availability. Understanding the effects of historic and current upland forest management actions on dry season stream flows is critical to developing long-term strategies for water supply, salmon recovery, and climate change adaptation. Uh, this presentation will detail the context, results of, and questions raised by a pilot research effort to quantify the effects of the forest management on summer stream flow in the South Fork Nooksack River. This collaborative effort between Natural Systems Design, Western Washington U University, and Nooksack Indian Tribe uh, included application of two state-of-the-science hydrological models to understand the direction and magnitude of influence on summer stream flow from forest management actions. Um, yeah, and I, I just personally, I was I was excited to see this uh, on the agenda. I, I spend the bulk of my work in in thinking about the riparian zone health uh, uh, zone and its you know in it, it, its uh, effects on the health of streams and and ideally for the for the restoration of our our fish species and specifically our salmon here in Washington. And um, we don't spend a lot of time in that program talking about quantity. We talk a lot about of you know temperature or sedimentation or or uh, large woody debris. But I think that you know, as you may have seen um, this fall in October, actually, DFW and the National Park System had to close a lot of the Olympic Peninsula streams to fishing uh, because the, the stream flows were just too low. So quantity is clearly something we have to talk about. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker is Julia Jay. She is a project engineer at Natural Systems Design. Um, a firm out here in the Pacific Northwest that is focused on river restoration and watershed assessment. Uh, Julia, I will leave it up to you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I've really enjoyed all the talks so far today. So um, let's get into it. Um, as Alex said, my name is Julia. I'm an engineer and scientist at Natural Systems Design. And as you may have guessed from his description of the uh, company that I work for, I am more of a water person than I am a forest person. I do have a degree from the forestry school at UW, but uh, my career has been mostly river and watershed focused. So that is where my specialties lie, and I'm just putting that out there as a disclaimer at the beginning of this talk. Um, so what I am here to talk about, oh, uh, I don't have controls to, oh, now I do, cool. <laughs> So what I'm here to talk about is a project that I've been working on over the past few years um, with my colleague Susan Dickerson Lang, who some of you may know, along with a whole host of other people, um, the South Fork Nooksack River Forest Hydrology Pilot Study. This is a, 
a big multidisciplinary project. So I just want to give a big blanket thanks to the tons of people that have contributed their specialties um, to this work. We've really had to reach out to all different types of people from agencies, different universities, tribes um, to get their input on uh, setting up these models and interpreting the results. So thanks to all of these people and a special thanks to the Nooksack Indian tribe for identifying the relationship between vegetation and stream flow as a knowledge gap in the South Fork Nooksack and for leading the charge to understand it. The Nooksack Indian tribe has facilitated a large body of work looking into the climate resilience and looking into climate resilience in the watershed. Um, and we are building on that work by uh, looking into the answers to these questions. So you're going to get kind of sick of this slide. I'm going to bring it back a few times throughout the uh, talk. Um, but this is really outlining kind of the, the questions we're asking and ultimately the answers or the, you know, answers question mark that we're going to find at the end. Um, so we're asking, what's the maximum impact of forest gaps on summer stream flow in the South Fork Nook Stack Basin? What's the mass maximum impact of stand age on summer stream flow in the South Fork Nooksack Basin? How do these impacts change under future conditions, under climate change conditions? And how do these impacts compare one to another? So there's a lot folded into these questions. The relationship between forest gaps and stream flow and between stand age and stream flow both have been uh, demonstrated in other studies in other basins. Um, so one of the big uh, things going on here is we want to localize that knowledge to the South Fork Nooksack Basin and understand um, how applicable or not applicable the um, existing literature is to this particular basin. Another point of interest is uh, we're looking at both of these processes simultaneously in the same basin. So we're able to compare them uh, in kind of an apples to apples way, uh, which is not something that we've really seen before in the literature. So um, that is sort of the framework for what we're going to be looking into today. And the way I'm going to structure this talk is I'm going to start out with kind of a description of the underlying processes that we're talking about and that are contributing to these relationships that we're investigating. Um, and then I'll move on to talking a little bit about the South Fork Nooksack Basin itself. Uh, and then we'll talk about the modeling methods that we used and the um, ultimately our results and discussion. So this first part where we're talking about underlying processes might be a little bit remedial for some of the people in this conference, but I think it's important that we all start out with a common basis of understanding because otherwise the results just make no sense. So just really underlying the remedial nature of this is the simplest graphic I could possibly make uh, depicting the water budget in a watershed. Um, so uh, since the question that we're asking is about the relationship between vegetation and stream flow and ultimately the uh, impact that vegetation can have on the water budget in a watershed, um, it's important to understand how the water budget works. So a water budget is simple. You've got water coming in, you've got water stored, and you've got water coming out, and all of that has to balance. So the water comes into a watershed as precipitation, either rain or snow. It's stored in the watershed as snowpack or as soil moisture. And then it can leave the watershed in a few different ways. It can flow over land into streams. It can infiltrate into the soil and flow through the groundwater, or it can evaporate, or it can be transpired by the vegetation in the watershed. And it's really that evapotranspiration uh, aspect that we're going to be digging into here. So there's three uh, big ways that vegetation in a watershed can impact the water budget. Um, so we're just going to walk through each, uh, all three of those and relate them back to the research questions that we're looking into. So the first one is pretty obvious. They're all pretty obvious, but the first one is interception. So um, it's a lovely time to walk through the snow and see snowy trees. Um, and I'm sure this is uh, something that everyone has experienced when rain falls, trees catch that rain, or when snow falls, trees catch some of that snow. Um, and uh, in so doing, they alter the net precipitation that enters into the water budget of a watershed. Um, some of the water or snow that falls, some of the rain or snow that falls onto trees evaporates before it makes it to the ground. Um, and that is, uh, that's just altering the equation before it even begins. 
So a few uh, statistics to back that up. Um, leaves, needles, and branches intercept 20 to 60% of precipitation annually. And in the maritime Pacific Northwest climate, which is where we're looking, um, it's been shown that 60 to 80% of snow can be intercept in in intercepted. And again, a portion of that intercepted precipitation evaporates or sublimates before entering into the water budget. And um, that portion changes with temperature and uh, a million other things. So that's your first one. Your second one is shading and sheltering. Uh, again, it's pretty obvious when you're standing in a meadow and you're in direct sunlight, uh, you're going to be warmer than if you're standing in the middle of a forest and you're in the shade. Um, and the effect of that is that the shading and sheltering from trees modifies the energy available for snow melt and evapotranspiration in the under canopy. And when you combine those two concepts, shading and interception, you arrive at the impact of snow gaps on the water budget. So there's a lot going on on this slide, but um, I think the bottom left diagram is a pretty good explainer of what goes on in a forest gap. So when you've got uh, when you've got a small gap in a forest, you don't have trees in that gap to intercept uh, precipitation. So we're talking, we're really particularly interested in snow. So you're getting more snow that makes it to the ground within that gap. But because it's a gap that's within a forest, the snow that makes it to the ground in that gap is shaded from the direct sunlight by the trees that surround it. So you get more snow that then uh, is encountering less energy to melt it. So is therefore going to persist later into the year um, and uh, then contribute its snow melt to stream flow in even later months. Uh, so this, uh, these pictures on the bottom right hand side are a pretty good uh, real life example of that. Um, on the left, you've got a picture of a gap. There's a lot of snow. On the right, you've got a picture of a forest at around the same elevation um, and uh, same basic time period uh, in the Cedar River watershed. And you can see in the forested area, there is less snow. So um, like I said before, we are not the first people to draw a line between, the, between this uh, gap phenomenon and summer stream flow. Um, this is just an example at the top is talking about the Snoqualmie Basin pilot study done by Jan and Son in 2020 um, shows that there's an 8 to 11 percent increase in summer flow uh, when the watershed is managed for gaps. Um, so keep that in your brain. And we're going to go back to the, um, the third way that vegetation impacts the water budget in a watershed, and that's transpiration. Obviously, trees suck up a bunch of water in order to live. Um, they use soil moisture. And the amount of uh, transpiration or the rate of transpiration depends on a lot of different factors, including elevation, aspect, the type of cover, um, et cetera. Uh, but the main influencer on transpiration that we're interested in is stand age. So it's been shown that uh, stand age is linked to transpiration rate. And I like to think of this kind of in the same way that I think about a, a human being growing up. Like when you're a teenager, you're eating like everything in the kitchen because you're growing so fast. And it's the same deal for trees. Young trees suck up a lot more water than mature trees do, just in the same way that uh, human teenagers eat a ton. And when you hit your 70s or 80s, you're not you're not really shoveling it down anymore. Um, and uh, of, so this pattern has been uh, observed in a lot of different case studies um, that, uh, first of all, so yeah, so basically once you clear cut a parcel, you get a short term decrease in transpiration because there's almost no vegetation. You've got super young saplings that just aren't taking up very much. But after the first few years, you then get an increase of transpiration once those trees reach teenager age um, and that persists until the trees mature. <clears throat> um, and this graphic on the left is uh, not well labeled, I'm just now noticing, but it's showing the uh, difference in transpiration rate between regenerating dug fir stands and old growth dug fir stands. So the bold is showing old growth and the not bold line is showing um, regenerating dug fir stands. And you can see over the course of a year, the regenerating stands are uh, transpiring at a much greater rate than the old growth stands.
So this is what we're interested in, um, and and this is what we are looking to see whether we can impact. Um, and obviously, all three of these things are impacted by uh, tree growth, forest management, and forest disturbances. Um, and uh, just to bring it all back to those research questions, um, these are these are the things that we're looking at. We've got a, a clear cut parcel on the left hand side, and we've got. Uh, forests that are managed for gaps on the right hand side and we're trying to see what the impacts of both of those uh, management decisions might have on summer stream flow in the South Fork Nooksack. Um, so this project is really all about the South Fork Nooksack watershed which is uh, here in all of its splendor. Um, you're going to get to know this shape of, a water, of the watershed pretty well. Um, so just a few stats about the watershed before we cruise on past it. It's 480 kilometers squared. It has a pretty high relief drainage area. It, it extends up to forested and bare rock slopes of the Twin Sisters and the foothills of the Western Cascade Mountain Range, all the way down to a pretty low agricultural valley um, from elevation of 65 meters to 2100 meters. Um, there's a lot of snow going on. There used to be glaciers in this watershed. There's not so much anymore, but there's still a lot of snow that's crucial to understanding the, um, the way that stream flow happens throughout the year in this watershed. So this is just showing a picture of the agricultural lands in, in the lowland areas. And then on the bottom left is forest lands in the up, up in the higher elevation areas. Um, and uh, land ownership in the South Fork Nooksack Basin is uh, split between, uh, well, in the lowland areas, there's a lot of private ownership, um, residential and agricultural. But in the higher elevations, it's mostly forest cover, and those forests are owned either by um, the Forest Service, by um, WDNR, or by private timber companies. So the Forest Service is uh, what's shown in green. Private timber is in brown and um, DNR lands are in blue. Um, so something else that's important to know about the South Fork Nooksack Basin is that the South Fork Nooksack River is a critical habitat for eight species of anadromous salmonids, including spring chinook salmon, steel steelhead, and bull trout. Um, and members of the Nooksack Indian tribe are reliant on salmon, particularly on spring Chinook salmon for subsistence, cultural, ceremonial, and commercial uses. And this is one of the main drivers of why we're looking into this, is that um, low temperature stream flow and sufficient quantities of stream flow during the summer months are crucial to salmon survival. And it's not just salmon, um, you know, obviously people live in this watershed and people need water to um, live, to do agriculture, industry, et cetera. Um, so it's crucial to have a sufficient amount of stream flow in the summer, both for in-stream and out-of-stream uses. And that uh, need becomes a bit more pressing when you think about how things are going to change um, in the future. So this graph is showing a uh, daily, showing annual stream flow in current conditions. That's in black, and then comparing that to projected uh, annual stream flow under climate change conditions, which the blue and red lines are showing two different climate models, and the gray uh, squiggles are basically showing the range of of climate models. Um, but all of the climate models say it generally the same thing, which is that in, in future conditions, you're going to have more stream flow in the winter months. You're going to have this, uh, this area in the spring, uh, which is usually right now we experience spring freshet where we're getting a lot of snow melt that's, that's creating pretty high flows um, in uh, snow dominated basins, that's going to more or less disappear under climate change conditions or be pushed earlier into the year, depending on how you look at it, because we're going to have higher temperatures, we're going to have less snow, and we're going to have that snow melting earlier. Um, and then the ultimate result of that is lower temperatures in the, or sorry, lower uh, stream flow quantities in the summer months in July, August, and September. And uh, projections have shown that stream flow is going to reduce by uh, 50 to 60 percent um, from existing conditions to climate change conditions. So um, that's a pretty good reason to look into how we can counteract that effect. So that 
is a pretty good description of our background. Um, so I'm going to now launch into uh, talking about the methods that we use to set up our experiment. And uh, the first portion of that is just talking about how hydrologic models work in the first place. So um, we use two different hydrologic models to look at these two separate questions of uh, forest gaps and of sand age. Um, we used DHSVM to look at uh, forest gaps, and we used Velma to look at stand age. And the reason that we did that is because while they're, they're very similar models, they're both physically based gridded models, um, they each have strengths and weaknesses that um, make them more or less appropriate for what we are looking at. So DHSVM has a really robust representation of canopy snow interception and the under canopy energy balance, both of which are obviously pretty crucial to understanding how gaps influence snow storage and snow melt. Uh, and Velma tracks biomass and tree age through time and allows for fine grained manipulation of forest disturbance and management regimes. It also allows transpiration to vary based on tree age, which is the main thing that we're looking into here. So we took this opportunity to uh, create and calibrate two separate hydrologic models in the same basin, which allows us to not only compare the effects of each of these management techniques, but also to compare both of these models um, and gain an understanding of where they differ and where they're the same um, and how that might influence um, research and management decisions going forward. Uh, so just a quick primer on how hydrologic models work. Um, so uh, these are gridded models, which means they take watershed wide inputs and divide them into a grid. Um, so spatial inputs at this level include a digital elevation model, uh, land cover, and that's specifying um, the type of land cover, as well as the age, as well as any kinds of disturbances, like you can specify, oh, in this area, there's going to be a 40 year rotation harvesting. And in this area, there's, um, you know, uh, passive management, all of those things you can specify. Um, and then also soils, soil type, soil depth, and all the hydraulic parameters that go along with that. Once you've got these spatial inputs down, you then put in the meteorology. So this is showing uh, 20 years of precipitation and temperature that we put into the model um, for uh, to, to spin it up. So um, uh, this graphic isn't the best, but it's kind of trying to emphasize that uh, temperature and precipitation also vary uh, over space. Uh, just like the other inputs do, um, but they, they vary over space and time, so it's kind of hard to draw a graphic in four dimensions. Um, but anyway, so we put in all of these things, and then once you've got the meteorology and all these other inputs, um, you run the model and you calibrate it to known data. And what the model is doing when it's running is it's tracking water within each grid cell. So it's saying for each of these little boxes, it's saying how much water is coming into this cell through precipitation, how much is uh, turning into soil moisture, how much is flowing down gradient into an adjacent cell, how much is being sucked up by trees. Um, and all of those things, it's doing all of those calculations for each cell within the watershed for every time step of meteorology that you put in. So for every, every day or for every three hours, depending on which model you're looking at, it's doing those calculations. Um, and then ultimately it is spitting out results. So the results are a time series of stream flow that corresponds to the meteorology and other inputs that you put in. So if you put in weather from 1991 to 2011, you're gonna get stream flow as a result from 1990 to 2011. Um, and uh, I, saw, I saw a question just pop up, how many cells are in the watershed? I cannot tell you that off the top of my head, but it's on a 90 meter by 90 meter resolution. So a bunch uh, is the answer. Um, uh, yeah, and then the other thing that you can get out of this is snapshots of soil moisture, evapotranspiration, biomass, snowpack, all sorts of things. You can get snapshots at any point in time. So if, during that 20 year time period, if you want to see like what a snowpack look like in the watershed in, you know, January 2nd of 2005, you, you could do that. 
there's really infinite outputs that you can get from this kind of a model, but these are the ones that we focused on. So now that we understand how hydrologic models work, we understand all the the underlying processes, we're going to get into our uh, uh, research setup. So first of all, we'll focus on forest gaps, the relationship between forest gaps and summer stream flow. And this is using the DHSVM model. So um, what I want to emphasize before uh, digging too far into this is that we were thinking about this study from a really kind of big ideas perspective. Um, we wanted to understand the full extent of the relationship between gaps, snow melt, and stream flow. Uh, so we modeled extreme end member scenarios. These are not uh, by any stretch of the imagination feasible management options that we're proposing, but we wanted to establish the bounds of the relationship to help guide future decisions. So with that in mind, uh, well, oh yeah, I added this extra slide just to emphasize it. So the, our research questions are those top four that are grayed out. The research questions are not, what is the best way to manage forests in the South Fork Nooksack Basin? And I'm just emphasizing that a lot because uh, if you look at our alternatives thinking that we're proposing them as either feasible or desirable, you're going to laugh us out of town. So um, just keep that in mind that really what we're looking for is what's the maximum impact and what are the bounds of impact that we can achieve. And then we can use those bounds to understand um, and guide future uh, more uh, feasible uh, management plans. So for gaps, the alternatives that we came up with for this end member scenario um, analysis are existing conditions, which is uh, sort of depicted here on the left hand side. This is just showing the National Land Cover Database coverage of the watershed. Uh, and then uh, the uh, alternative scenarios are the gap scenarios. So we have a gap 40 scenario and a gap 28 scenario. And in both of those, uh, what we're doing is we are modeling the watershed, uh, assuming that all coniferous pixels above 700 meters of elevation are managed for gaps. So we've got 40 meter gaps basically in every forested pixel that encounters snow. Um, and then the second one is 28 meter gaps in every forested pixel that encounters snow. So just different sizes of gaps, but um, managing every possible uh, spot in the watershed that could be managed um, due to land cover. So that was the setup. Um, we calibrated the existing conditions model. We uh, created from that existing conditions model these two alternative scenarios where we're managing for gaps. Um, and I'm about to show you results, but before I do, I just want to share this extremely um, overused quotation, so overused that I actually don't know who said it uh, in the first place. All models are wrong, but some are useful. If you've ever done hydrologic or hydraulic modeling or really any kind of modeling, um, this is a mantra that gets repeated, and it's important to take it into account when you're looking at these results, because I'm going to throw out numbers, going to throw out percentages, and um, it's going to be really easy to hang on those percentages and expect that to be the answer. But um, it's important to remember that these numbers and these results are based on hydrologic models. They're not based on observation. And any model makes a whole host of assumptions about the way that um, the processes that it's depicting work. Um, so there's uh, there's think about each number that I'm giving as having pretty big error bounds around it, um, just based on the different parameters um, that are input and the different uh, assumptions that are going into it. So all that being said, uh, when you compare those three forest gap scenarios that I talked about, um, you find some pretty interesting uh, divergences in stream flow. So um, what we're looking at here on the left side is um, a stream flow in a typical year. So in this case, we chose 1995. Uh, and this is showing uh, stream flow from the existing conditions model that's in brown, stream flow from the gap 28 model, which is the in uh, blue, and stream flow from the uh, gap 40 model, which is in green. I feel like I may have said those colors wrong, but you guys can all read. Anyway, uh, the so what's interesting about this graph, and notice also that this graph is on a log scale that can kind of throw people off sometimes. But uh, what's interesting about this graph is that in the winter months, you're not seeing a great deal of difference. 
But when you get into the summer months, you start to see a, 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 a noticeable divergence in stream flow between existing conditions and the gap scenarios. And when you summarize that, uh, if you look on the right hand side, look at these box plots. These box plots are summarizing August stream flow over 30 years. So in each of these scenarios, you can see that mean August stream flow uh, increases from existing conditions to the gap 28 scenario to the gap 40 scenario. Um, and these in increases are pretty substantial. It's a 10% increase um, to gap 28 and a 25% increase to gap 40. Um, so I'm just going to leave you with that for a second and going to jump into now our stand age analysis, which follows a pretty similar pattern. So just keep all that forest gap stuff in your head. Um, and now I'll talk about how we set up our stand age analysis uh, using Vel the Velma model. So this is the same approach. We're using this big ideas end member scenario analysis um, uh, to come up with our scenarios. So for the stand age analysis, our scenarios are an existing condition scenario where we attempted to depict forest management as closely as possible to what is currently being done today on the ground. Um, then we have an all harvest scenario where we said, what would happen to stream flow if every single forested pixel in the watershed were being harvested on a 40 year rotation? Uh, and then we have an old growth uh, scenario where we said, what would happen in the watershed if all forested pixels were uh, left untouched and allowed to reach maturity? So um, for this uh, model, we ran uh, the 20 year meteorological data, data on a loop for 150 or maybe 200 years um, in order for to allow the trees to reach maturity because we're starting out with the trees being the age that they were in 1991. Um, and so uh, we have to let those trees age to a point of maturity in order to see the impact of that difference in transpiration rate between maturing trees and mature trees. Uh, and that's what this is getting at uh, in a little bit more detail, but I think I'm gonna maybe skip over that just in the interest of time. So again, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Here are the results. Um, this is a similar graph to what we're looking at with forest gaps, but this, instead of showing a typical year, this is um, stream flow summarized over the last 20 years of the simulation. Um, so the lines that you're looking at are the medians and the envelopes are just showing sort of min and max uh, stream flows within that time period. And here we've got existing conditions in green, all harvest in red and old growth in blue. And once again, uh, when you look at the uh, the summaries of August stream flow, which are these box plots on the top right side, um, you see a pretty clear uh, stair step uh, from existing conditions. Median August flow decreases by 10% uh, when you harvest every tree in the watershed. And from existing conditions, uh, median August flow increases by 26% when you harvest every, or sorry, when you leave every pixel in the watershed alone. Oh, and what's what else I wanted to say about this is that it's really similar, these two, the results from these two forest management practices as they influence uh, stream flow are kind of shockingly similar. Um, and it's important to remember that like, although the results are the same, the drivers of the results are very different. Um, in uh, With forest gaps, we were seeing uh, increase in summer stream flow because the forest gaps allow for there to be more snowfall that then persists later into the summer and co uh, contributes uh, snow, snow melt to summer stream flow. Uh, with the sand age analysis, what we're seeing is just um, more trees that are more mature uh, covering the watershed and thereby taking up less water uh, in the old growth scenario than in the existing condition scenario where there are a bunch of teenager trees that are taking up a lot of water that could otherwise um, go into the stream. So it's just important to keep those two drivers separate in your in your brain. Um, I think I'm going to skip this for the moment, just in the interest of time. 
um, and move on to the climate change question. Uh, good question. How do you create gaps without cutting trees? I'm going to get to that um, in the end about how these two uh, questions relate to each other. Um, so how do these uh, impact, how do these impacts change under future or climate change conditions? So um, I'm just going to remind you of the pattern that we're expecting in uh, current conditions as compared to future conditions uh, when we're looking at climate change. Uh, and then now I'll show you how the impacts of forest gaps uh, change in future conditions as opposed to current conditions. So what we're showing here in the dark, the dark colors are current conditions, dark brown and dark green, and the light colors are showing future conditions. And here it's just existing conditions and the gap 40 scenario. So we've got this big increase in current conditions, uh, while in future conditions, the increase or the change is in the same direction. Um, there's still an increase when you're managing for gaps, but it's much smaller. So the increase is 25% in current conditions, but it's only 9% in future conditions. Um, and the reasoning for this is uh, in future conditions, there's hotter temperatures overall. So there's less snow overall and snow melt is earlier in general um, in future conditions as compared to current. Um, and so those impacts of creating more snowpack and pushing it later into the summer are just uh, reduced because there's just less snow to work with. Um, so all that being said, it is a lot smaller. I and mean, when you look at them one next to another, it, it looks like kind of defeating. However, an increase of 9% is not nothing. Um, and looking, looking forward uh, into climate change times, an increase of 9% uh, might mean a great deal to fish and people. So now we're looking at the same slide for stand age. Um, again, the dark colors are current conditions and the light colors are future conditions. And once again, you're seeing kind of the same relationship. Um, you see the same pattern as you did in, in current conditions, in future conditions, but the magnitude is reduced. So it's an increase of 26% uh, from future uh, from future existing, sorry, it's an increase in 26% from existing conditions to old growth conditions in current uh, weather. And in, in the future, that increase is reduced to only 11%. Um, and, you know, you can say most of the same things that I said for the last slide for this one, but again, the drivers are different. Um, so here, the, uh, the reason why the impact is reduced, I, I think it might be due to um, the transpiration of stands in summer perhaps becoming water limited, in which case the difference in transpiration rate between young and old trees um, may not be uh, as relevant if they're both water limited to begin with. That one I feel a little bit less sure of than the, the gap explanation that I gave, and I think it warrants a little bit more digging into the models to understand exactly what's going on um, to make that change. But regardless, an 11% increase in summer stream flow in future conditions is not nothing, and in fact it, it buffers 20% of the decline that's expected uh, to come with, uh, with climate change conditions. So finally, how do these impacts compare? And I'm not going to dig into this uh, too deeply um, here just for the purposes of time, but um, I think this is a, a crucial part of our study is it's giving us the opportunity to compare these two hydrologic models and to really understand what's going on um, under the hood. Um, but when you're just comparing the results, you'll forgive me for having adjusted this uh, gaps uh, box plot on the left hand side so that it's the same scale as the one on the right. Um, but I, I think when you're when you're able to look at them at the same scale, it makes it a little bit easier to compare one to one to the other. So you see a similar direction of change um, between uh, managing for forest gaps and managing managing for stand age. You see a similar magnitude of change, um, uh, but there's different drivers of change, like I've discussed. Um, and what's interesting uh, about there being different drivers of change is that actually these two management techniques could be additive uh, because they're not acting on the same uh, processes. So now I'm just going to roll through some summaries, uh, some summary points. So we saw both gaps and stand age impact summer discharge. 
Um, and again, we feel uh, confident in the direction. We feel confident in the general magnitude. It's within the range that has been seen in the literature um, that has been done on the subject in other watersheds. But uh, again, we just want to. I just want to emphasize that, like that, those twenty-five percent, twenty-six percent numbers are not hard and fast numbers. They're numbers with definite error bars around them. We saw uh, significant impacts of similar magnitudes, but the scenarios that we modeled are very extreme. They're end member scenarios. So again, like we saw big impacts, but any feasible management scenario is not going to achieve uh, impacts of that size. Um, so that's another important thing to keep in mind. Um, and then another thing to uh, take away from this is that the impacts that we're seeing are smaller than climate change. That doesn't mean that they're useless or that we shouldn't uh, manage for them. I think that uh, under climate change conditions, summer stream flow is going to be a real issue for fish and people. And any increase, especially increases of 9 to 11 percent, uh, might make a huge difference. But uh, we can't necessarily say, oh, well, we've basically solved climate change. We, we, we don't have... Uh, an effect large enough to counteract the impact of climate change on summer stream flow. Uh, so um, next steps. So we are still working uh, on this project. That was phase one that I talked about. Um, we're working on getting that published, but we're also working uh, to um, answer a few more questions and dig a little bit deeper into this uh, into this uh, basin and both of the models that we've created. Um, and we also have been using uh, similar approaches to look at other watersheds. Um, we've been, we've looked at the upper, we're in the process of looking at the upper Puyallup watershed um, using similar modeling techniques. And we have worked in an advisory capacity with the Tulalip tribe who's doing something similar. So um, it seems like there's a lot of interest in these models. And as a result, we really wanna understand how they're working um, and how they can be applied in a more refined way than just this big uh, end member uh, analysis that we did. So in order to refine that a little bit more, we want to look into, uh, for the stand age analysis, we want to look into um, how thinning plays into this whole thing, because in the descriptions that I gave above, the thinning is not included in any of the scenarios. And then we also want to compare rotation ages, theoretically, with an understanding of how transpiration rate changes as trees age. Um, there should be kind of a, an inflection point um, where if you manage, uh, if you have rotation ages below that point, it's going to take up uh, a lot of water. But if you have rotation ages that are uh, longer than that point, then the stream flow contributions will be greater. So we're interested in refining uh, uh, models to understand where that inflection point is. And then for both stand age and gaps, we're interested in looking at does placement matter within a watershed? Um, if you're managing at a uh, high elevation or a low elevation, if you're managing near a stream or far from a stream uh, on a north facing slope or on a south facing slope, all of those things, we're looking into understanding better, um, both in the South Fork Nooks uh, River Basin and in general, um, what the impact of uh, placement is on these results. And then, of course, digging into the weeds of the models, which is something that I always want to do and never have enough time to do. Um, so that kind of wraps it up. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening to my talk. I'm pretty excited about all this research, and I would love to hear questions. Thanks, Juliet. Um, I'm glad you presented this. And I'm happy you're excited by all this and want to dig further into models. It seems like you have a job you want, so that's great. <laughs> um, my, uh, I'll, well, I'll say this, my wife is a researcher and she said that uh, people who do research don't want to get right into the results. They also want to talk about their models. So I have a question for you. Um, when when starting your, um, uh, you know, thinking about how you're doing this, I knew you, I know you wrote in your paper that you met with land managers and owners in the, in the, 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 the watershed. Uh, and was just curious how detailed was the modeling of the forest management currently that you know stand age analysis the rotation ages i know you touched on it a little bit but um yeah great question more. and as you uh, as you correctly identified i'm thrilled to talk about it because i love talking about how i set up my models so um yeah we did we talked with um people at the forest service and people at um wdnr 
to um, gain uh, as as close as possible a, a good understanding of what what was happening uh, within the South Fork Nooksack River Basin in terms of forest management. So what we ended up doing um, with the advice of all these people that we met with is we divided management based on um, land ownership and also based on elevation. Um, so we had uh, three rotation ages for uh, uh, areas that were owned by owned and managed by uh, the DNR were uh, developed into kind of low elevation, mid elevation, high elevation um, forests. And then within those, each of those was managed, I think on a 50 year rotation, 70 year rotation and 80 year rotation. And then that those same elevation bands were brought into the um, private timber parcels and the, uh, the rotation ages were bumped down for the private timber parcels. So it's, I think it's um, 40, 40, 60 and 70. Um, from low elevation to high elevation are the rotation ages. And then there, we also put a good amount of effort into identifying areas that uh, were uh, are protected. So we didn't have any management uh, or any, um, uh, any timber harvesting in uh, forest service lands. And we also uh, cut out riparian buffers as well as um, certain habitats like marbled murrelet and spotted owl habitats we removed from what would depict existing conditions forest management. That's that's a lot more detailed than I thought from the beginning. Um, so you did have a question. You said you could get to it, I think, um, about creating gaps. Yeah, how do you create gaps without cutting trees? Uh, you don't. <laughs> um, I think um, the this analysis, it, it's an interesting question though, and it's an important one when we're comparing these two because um, they can be additive and they can also be subtractive. So one of uh, something that I didn't talk about is the there is a double effect when you're if you're creating gaps, then you are effectively clear cutting little pockets. Um, so then you do have that effect of uh, transpiration rate changing with stand age um, that's sort of happening at the same time as the snow related impacts that you're getting from the gaps. So. Um, I don't have a model that can do both of those things at the same time at the moment, um, but I think, you know, the best we can do is sort of think through um, the impacts and think through like the areas impacted um, and combine them conceptually. Okay, I have another one for you. This is from Paula Swedeen. Do you plan on looking at other uh, scenarios for age? And I'm like, I'll qualify, I'll qualify that with another sentence. My understanding is that an 80 to 100 year rotation would have a similar result to the old growth scenario looking at the Michelle Watershed Velma results. Yes, yeah, great question and you're totally right. Um, we do have plans for that. Um, I, I, we don't have specific ones that I can really list for you, but that is like really the next spot that we want to go to um, is understanding thinning and rotation ages. And you're totally right. There has been research showing that rotation ages um, at 80, deg 80 degrees, 80 years or above, uh, uh, it's it's been shown that trees that are 80 years or older uh, have the same transpiration rate as old growth trees or more or less the same. In which case, uh, managing trees at an 80 year rotation age would be the same effectively as as uh, never harvesting them at all if we're just looking at this um, hydrologic impact. So um, we do have plans to look into that and sort of find sort of like is 80 years the cutoff everywhere is it um how much is it determined by um uh the underlying uh equations that are used by the model and things like that so we're definitely digging into that and i think that's a really important area to investigate next yeah um yeah that, that's that's it's interesting i mean i guess you guys were looking at the extremes and so you could narrow it down if you have more time to do more work. Exactly. Yeah, that was kind yeah. of the point. We wanted to establish like what, you know, there's no point in really fiddling with the specific bits if you don't know what the what yeah. the boundaries are. So now that we know the boundaries, we can do a lot more fiddling. Cool. Um, we have a question from Gus Satius. Um, 
You mentioned in your intro that forest harvest initially increases water yield due to reduced transpiration before trees start to regrow. This would imply that shorter rotation, the shorter the rotation length, the greater the downstream water yield. Why is that effect not reflected in your all harvest scenario? Great question. Um, it's a it's a short it's a very short term effect. That's why it's like on on the order of one to three years. So uh, if you clear cut uh, the whole basin and uh, left it, you know, re, re clear cut it every two years, then you probably would see an increase in summer stream flow. I don't think we should do that. But um, actually, I think that that is something that um, the Forest Service at some point in the distant past learned that that is true and tried to manage forests in that way, um, specifically for hydrologic benefit, uh, somewhat depressingly. But um, uh, yeah, the reason that you're not seeing it in my results is because in the all harvest scenario, the trees are on a 40 year rotation. And so the majority of the trees in the watershed are between three years and 40 years old. And that three years to 40 years old is like the teenager age when they're sucking up water at a greater rate than in the, uh, than when they're mature and th then when they're, you know, saplings, babies. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about what to ask next. Um, the there are a lot of the more you talk the more i'm i'm curious um were there uh what do i want to say so i'll i'll just say about this the, the, what what you just said was very interesting because the, in the work that i i work in, in i told you it was the riparian zone so um there's been a lot of research lately talking about temperature effects of harvesting close to streams and then those temperature effects go away as you get to like closer to 3 to 10 years right but but now you're talking about the water benefit going away at the same kind of age. So I'm really curious if, if y'all get to the looking at the proximity to streams um, questions. Um, so I guess it's not much of a question, but that's where you put my brain saying that. Um, I'm interested in that too. <laughs> I think uh, it'll be good to know. So were there any, um, I guess for you, like personal surprises that came out of the results? I personally, I was surprised at how this is a boring answer, <laughs> but I was surprised at how similar uh, the how similar the two models were, um, and also how similar the results were from both processes. I mean, really, it's a coincidence. It just has to do with how much area, um, how much forested area in the South Fork Nooksack happens to be above the snow line, um, is really what's determining the the impact size of the gap management scenario. And so mm -hmm. that's why they, you know, they just ended up being the same, but it is pretty shocking. We have like a 25% increase in the gap scenario and a 26% increase in the stand age um, yeah. uh, scenarios. So I was surprised by that. And in a more in a more general sense, I, I had never really done an exercise where I compared two separate hydrologic models in the same basin for the same calibrated right. to the same number of years. Um, and I, I've been really interested in seeing how they're similar and how they're different um, and sort of digging into some of those things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I guess that leads me to the next question, and this may not be your line of work, so you know, if you can't answer it, you can't answer it. But I know you approached them prior to the study, but now that you have some results, are folks approaching managers now or thinking about what to do next with this information? Or is it more, let's get to stage two and then think about that? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, you're very right. It is not really my line of work. <laughs> um, but I, I think in general, in general, we are trying to caution uh everyone to like kind of hold up <laughs> you know we're we've we've created bounds but i think before we really move into putting those boundaries uh, into practice it's important to understand how those boundaries change um you know with all these different factors and also how they scale um between you know smaller sub watersheds and large watersheds all of those things so yeah we're, we're really trying to focus on uh, uh drilling down into the details before we like encourage this to be transformed into aggressive practice yeah um i we got one more model question and it's from maggie taylor so i'll throw it out there because we have a couple minutes do you think there is a future potential for integrating the strengths and weaknesses of both models into one super model? I do. 
I do. I love that question. Um, actually, yes, DHSBM uh, is like in the process of gaining the ability to model forests in much the same way that Velma has. Um, so uh, yeah, right now they don't really have a method to allow trees to age. You just put in trees at the age that they are at the beginning, and that's what it is. But um, yeah, in the past year, uh, I've heard sort of whispers of this happening in the DHSVM, uh, you know, from DHSVM modelers. I'm not exactly sure how far along it is, but I think it's, you know, within the next few years seems realistic based on my understanding. In which case, yeah, then we'll have a friggin' supermodel. I mean, you know, if it, uh, whenever there's new, um, whenever there's new parts of a model, you have to then, uh, uh, what's the word? validate those uh, aspects of the model through a lot of different um, methods. So it, it's not an immediate, like, we're going to get it, and then we're going to trust it. It's like, we're going to get it, and then we're going to have to go through several years of being like, is this, do we believe this? And then and then we'll have it. But yeah, ultimately, it cool. should happen. Um, right on. Well, I, I, th I think this is great. You know, it's 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 sort of at the front of probably what 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 needs to happen and you know what sort of happened in carbon and we have this thing you got to pay people for the benefit you want to get from it but you could you could figure out a way to pay for quantity or something um so i don't know i i, I like it i appreciated it all so thanks um and thank thanks. you all for attending this uh and all of our sessions today it was a, it was a, it was a great day i had an awesome day i hope you did as well um our final session for the day will start in just a minute, and it is recorded remarks from the Washington State's Commissioner of Public Lands, Hillary Franz. Um, then tomorrow, as a reminder, we have four more sessions beginning at 9 a.m. with a panel I'm really looking forward to on tribal carbon offset projects and the Climate Commitment Act here in Washington. Thanks, everyone, uh, uh, and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>